Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on the world of high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Adaptiva. We have the founder and CEO, Andreas Olofsson. Andreas, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, Rich, for inviting me. Well, well, thanks for coming on. You know, Andreas, I'm, I'm curious. I've, I've read about Adaptiva, but can you give us the elevator? I mean, uh, who is Adaptiva and who do you help? Sure. Um, so we uh, are a... Uh, semiconductor company started in 2008. Uh, we came out of uh, analog devices initially, and uh, we do multi-core chips, uh, accelerated chips that would sit next to an ARM or Intel, um, and uh, really our specialty is low power. Um, the latest 28 nanometer chip that we announced in July that we were sampling has uh, 70 gigaflops per watt at the core level and 50 gigaflops per watt at the chip level. Um, the chip itself consists of 64 risk cores running at 800 megahertz running completely independently, and, uh, you know, this is the product that we're now taking to market. Um, in terms of the company, we're uh, five engineers, and we are, uh, uh, you know, have had about $1 million in revenue on $2.5 million in raised uh, equity capital. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. You know, uh, I don't know if you saw, there's quite a buzz about power efficiency this weekend from a story in the New York Times about data centers, and it seems like a very uh, topical issue for us to be uh, learning about today. Sure. No, we have uh, we've been uh, we've been at the edge of this for for years now. Uh, we really look going after markets that are even more energy sensitive than the data centers, uh, things like smartphones and uh, UAVs and drones. Um, those guys tend to have an even bigger pain point. But uh, I think it's certainly coming around to data centers now as well. So uh, so I've actually skipped ahead here. Um, you know, probably a slide three. I can start about you know what what we're starting today, what our announcement is. Um, so uh, we've been uh, we've been pushing this chip into different markets for uh, a couple of years now, and uh, and really one of the things we found is really missing is uh, a really low cost open parallel computing platform, um, and um, you know parallel computing is a big problem. It, you know our refill is not being adopted quickly enough. Uh, it's really you know the hardware is here and now, but uh, the program will still need a lot of effort and retraining all the programmers to become parallel programmers is a pretty daunting effort, we believe. Um, so we want to do something about it. So that's what this uh, Parallel uh, Computer Project is about. Uh, it's about launching uh, a pretty revolutionary new platform in terms of cost and, and openness. Um, so, you know, if you look at slide uh, um, slide five, uh, you know, what is it? You know, it, it's open source. It means the uh, all the board design files, the, the Gerbers and the schematics are going to be released uh, uh, on an open source license. All the development tools are going to be free and open source. That means drivers, uh, uh, runtime libraries, uh, you know, all compilers, all debuggers, completely open. Uh, you know, our goal is to make it very inexpensive so that anybody can get it. One of the challenges that we've had in the in last uh, uh, couple of years is is our price points been very high, and so we had to turn away lots of people who really were interested but didn't have the budget. Uh, so we think at ninety-nine dollars, anybody should be able to afford it. And uh, you know, it's extremely high performance, um, with sixty-four cores at, uh, uh, or sixteen to sixty-four cores, I should say. Um, you know, it's a fair number of, of uh, generic CPU cores uh, that really are, are, you know, amend themselves to uh, a number of different programming models, uh, not just uh, OpenCL, which we already support. But possibly MPI and OpenMT um, or data flow programming. So, you know, we really intend this to be a fabric for people to explore different programming models. Um, the, you know, the whole platform itself is uh, less than the size of a is the size of a credit card, uh, consumes about five watts typical, um, and uh, is, a, you know, a really a neat little complete computer. You know, you plug in your uh, USB peripherals, your Ethernet cable, uh, HDMI connection, and, and you're up and running. Um, so next slide, you know, why another board? There are tons of little boards out there, uh, from uh, Arduino to Raspberry Pi to uh, just a bunch of uh, Android boards. And, uh, you know, our feeling was that uh, those boards really don't address the need for a parallel computing platform. Um, the parallel hardware that's out there in mobile platforms tends to be not be open. Um, it's only accessible to people who, uh, who sign NDAs. Um, and this, uh, this is a problem. Uh, you're not going to reach researchers and uh, and really hobbyists that way, um, and um, also some you know a lot of lot of the higher end boards that you could find in a desktop you know like plug-in GPU cards, um, they are they are expensive and and um, uh, they uh, 
um, they aren't really amenable also to the uh, to the mobile platforms, the embedded platforms that need to do research. Um, so the uh, the project we're pulling together here is uh, you know the crowdfunding model, and uh, um, the idea is that uh, we're going to do something about this quickly. We're going to go directly to the market, uh, try to bypass all the gatekeepers, um, and uh, let the market decide if they want a you know a 99 kit to uh, start exploring on. Um, which is exactly what the you know the crowdfunding concept is about, um, and uh, you know once you go directly to the consumer, of course you have to take the bold step of really opening up the architecture completely. Um, so that's a, for us that's a pretty scary step, but we're uh, we're going to do that. Um, now you know in terms of our epiphany architecture on slide seven, um, you know we it's a multi-core architecture, it's a coprocessor architecture, so it's really never meant to run an operating system like an Intel or, or an ARM processor. It's really meant to be more like a GPU. You know, say as an accelerator, the uh, Intel or ARM will do all the operating system stuff, uh, all the uh, high-level application management, and will accelerate uh, some tasks in the program. Um, now, what's kind of unique about our approach is that each one of our cores really is a full-fledged risk core uh, that can run any you know any kind of C program, really only limited to the size of the program, uh, si uh, the the code size, um, and um, um, so you know, in, we're doing that. We really think we have a kind of unique value compared to other accelerators that have come before us, where the accelerator will do a little bit of work, send the data back to the host, and then get a little bit more work and send it back. And uh, if you have very large data sets, work great. For small data sets, uh, you generally be I/O uh, limited. Here, since we can run full tasks from start to completion, uh, because of our sophisticated cores. Um, we think we can really work on that IO bottleneck that comes between the host and the accelerator. Um, slide eight is the uh, is a high level uh, uh, diagram of uh, you know the the features on the parallel computer. Um, like I said, it's a fully functional computer uh, with um, uh, HDMI, micro SD, two USB ports, gigabit Ethernet, um, one gigabyte of RAM, uh, and mm. two dual core A9 processor. Along with our own, uh, you know, 16-core or 16-core RISC uh, processor. Um, in addition, it has the GPIO on it, so this really is meant to be an extendable kit that you can plug on all kinds of sensors on. Um, hardware details. Uh, so uh, again, it's a dual-core ARM A9 uh, with Neon. Uh, this thing runs Ubuntu uh, out of the box and uh, uh, reaches 100 gigaflops with the 64-core version. And uh, finally, it can be powered off of uh, either USB uh, or uh, from a 5-volt DC jack. Um, now, you know, this is, a, you know, some strong statements coming up here, but uh, we, you know, we, we really believe in that to scale forward uh, in terms of computing uh, density and performance, we need a new approach. Um, we need something that's simpler to use than what we have today for high-performance computing. And we need something that with great energy efficiency. And, and we claim that uh, there's no such project on, on the market today. Um, and uh, you know, maybe we have it, maybe somebody else will come up with it, but definitely there's a lot of room for research here. Um, slide 11 um, just shows uh, what uh, uh, the efficiency gap is. You know, why energy efficiency is so important. Uh, people always want more performance uh, and ex you know. Uh, geometrically more so every year, and um, you know unless you keep improving energy efficiency by the same scale, you can open be opening up a bigger and bigger gap, uh, and that's a, a huge problem. Um, a couple of examples, design cases uh, where we think uh, this kind of technology could help. Uh, one comes from the smartphone, uh, where you know you look at the the current Apple chip, which is a very large chip. Um, the, this is the A5X. 165, 69 uh, square millimeters, um, adding 16 of our cores would be uh, adding a pretty tiny amount of area to the current solution. So, um, and you know, adding something like 9x to the performance. Um, so we think this is a, a pretty big breakthrough. Uh, you know, kind of about the same power and cost, and yet having uh, 9x performance uh, at demand. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't run 16 of these cores full throttle all the time if you want to save battery life. But it's great to know that it's there when you really need to turn it on. Um, second case is uh, you know you look at uh, parallel computing and servers. 
Um, and the way we see, you know, the, the smallest incremental change that we can make is, you know, take standard servers. Uh, many of them come with unpopular PCI Express slots. Uh, this, the idea here would be we'd make a, a low power card on the order of 40 watts per card, uh, populate with a number of our Epiphany accelerated chips, um, and uh, it would all be programmed with OpenCL from the host processor. Um, and really, it comes down to if you look at how many cores we can give. Now, not all CPU cores are made the same. You know, you obviously can't compare our CPU core to a, uh, um, uh, Intel, um, you know, i7 type core, but um, um, it can be very useful for certain tasks. Um, and um, so, if you look at the cost density and the power density you can have here, if the programming model is changed, um, it's uh, it's pretty fundamental uh, breakthrough. Now, uh, in terms of uh, where we see this going, uh, you know, this is really just the beginning. Uh, our latest chips were done in 28 nanometers. Uh, we fit 64 cores in an area of 10 square millimeters, so a little bit more than you know, three and a half by you know, three and a half by three and a half millimeters or so. And uh, you know, going forward, if we start start scaling down to seven nanometer or 10 nanometer, um, with our architecture, which uh, has shown itself to be very, very scalable both in terms of scaling down for process geometry and scaling up in terms of number of cores, um, we believe we're someday going to see, you know, one teraflop per watt at the core level and, uh, and you know, up to 64,000 cores on a chip. Um, so that's what the future holds. And uh, if you look, you know, the, now the question is if it's 2018 or 2020, but if you look out that far, you go, well, if we're going to be ready by then with, uh, with the hardware, and that's more or less a, it's also certainty, then uh, we better get going quickly with programming models and uh, and programmers that can use that kind of power. Um, and so, um, you know, what is the second point? What do we see for the future? Is you know, true heterogeneous computing. We don't believe the GPU can solve uh, all problems. We think they're they're great for certain problems, but there's a, a need for another type of computing solution in there. Uh, the big CPUs are always going to be there to run legacy code, um, but there is definitely a room for having thousands of small CPUs on the same die. Um, and uh, and that, that is kind of uh, where we see it, you know, thousands of cores on a chip, heterogeneous computing on a chip, um, and uh, that's the address, the problem we want to address. And that's the reason we're releasing this uh, parallel uh, computer to really enable researchers to start playing around with these concepts. So thanks for that. Uh, you know, a couple questions here. Uh, you developed this uh through Kickstarter, this this uh, you're basically democratizing this platform, right? Making it very accessible, and they start writing code on it, and they get it to scale. Well, what's the next step for those users then? Do, do they uh, do they help you, you know, develop the next platform, uh, like a server-based thing, like we see in this one chart, or what do you think? Well, so the, I mean, the first thing we're going to do once this is funded is we're going to put up all our documentation, all our data sheets on the web. And so mm -hmm. that you know, at that point, people could even start designing boards for our chips. Mm -hmm. So it's like an open source uh, hardware platform as well. Exactly. You know, our, our chips uh, aren't going to be open sourced, but everything mm -hmm. above our chips, you know, the the, yeah. um, the boards and so forth, are going to be open sourced. And then you know, this uh, this chart number fifteen here, we're talking about heterogeneous computing. Do you foresee this as being a, a, a key component of, say, an exascale machine or something that would go up uh, that high? Um, I, I think I think it should be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, I've been I've been around designing DSPs for for 15 years, and uh, you know, we used to uh, try to put in everything but the kitchen sink in our DSP in terms of instruction sets and features, so that you know, this general purpose digital thing and processor could address all different applications in the market. It was, it was very clear what happened. The, the more features you put in, the slower things go, and you know the bulkier things get. So, the idea of having you know fixed or programmable computing solution that each address a, a certain subdomain of of all the applications out there is really, I, I think, the only way to uh, do things efficiently going forward. And then, uh, Andres, as far as economies of scale, right? Do, do you think the people that that sell the mobile devices? Do they have a use for this kind of thing as well that might help you keep the cost down? So, um, you know, I'm going to speak a little bit about the cost, keeping the cost down, because uh, to me it's a bit of a myth. Um, yeah. 
Today, uh, we have, as a five-person startup company, we have direct access to global foundries um, at 28 nanometer, and our, our wafer prices are just fine. Um, so I would say that uh, you know, today, chip design has actually never been cheaper uh, in terms of the effort. The efficiency of each engineer today and the tools available means that a five-person company can put together a chip. Um, and then it's just a matter of uh, you know paying for a mass set, which is expensive. It can be millions of dollars. But uh, once you pay for a mask set, uh, it just depends on what size uh, die you have. You can produce, uh, you know, if you take, for example, uh, our latest chip, 10 square millimeters, at a, at a 20 nanometer, 300 millimeter wafer, we can yield thousands of dies per wafer, um, which puts the price per chip at something very, very low. And, and Andrews, I'm curious about the, the business model. You chose the Kickstarter, the crowdsourcing model to, to get this going. Did, did you look at uh, that versus what, like a VC funding or something? And, and why did you make that choice? So, um, it, you know, it's really a, a matter of last resort. Uh, we've, we've tried every other avenue. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, every avenue there's a roadblock. And, and the VC funding, uh, it's just that the equation doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. You know, they, um, there's, there's an overwhelming impression that it's going to co cost tens of millions of dollars to bring up this kind of uh, effort. And uh, if the exit prices aren't high enough, the just equation is broken for them. They won't ever see enough value for, for their investment. Uh, certainly not if you compare to the some of the social uh, startups that are coming out. So, you know, money is being pulled out of semiconductor into other markets um, in terms of VCs. Um, so, you know, this is kind of um, us going directly to the uh, to the end market and saying, "Do you like this?" Right? It's a it's a it's a direct popularity concept, con uh, contest and um, we hope you're right. Uh, we haven't launched yet. So, so you're coming up with this this Kickstarter, and our, our listeners might be interested. How do they engage? Do they wait for the Kickstarter um, effort to start and then uh, um, do their pledge, or what would you suggest? Yeah. So the uh, you know we're going to be launching uh, you know very very soon, and uh, as as soon as we do, uh, they can go up on the um, uh, on the project. Uh, and, uh, and and pledge a you know modest amount as much as they want, and, and based on those pledges, you know, once the, if the project is successful, and we have all reasons to believe that it will be, then they would get a, a reward for that, um, and it could be a you know a $99 kit or a $199 kit. Um, we're going to build everything at cost, um, so we're not you know not trying. We 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 we're going to have. The question that we have for these kits is, is really if we uh, if we break even, but that's really our problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but we're going to be close to breaking. It's not about making profit. It really is about creating a community around this kind of architecture and, and getting it to the hands of as many people as possible. That's terrific. You know, I, I applaud you for using Kickstarter. I got involved a couple years ago with a project there that uh, was going to open source classical music, and it, uh, it, 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 it caught on and it worked, and that site's available today. And just for me, I did my little pledge, but it's gratifying to be part of something like that. So I... I hope that HPC community feels the same way about what you're doing here. Thank you. No, I, um, we hope so. Uh, like, I, like I said, we've had many, many people interested in our technology in the last uh, last year, and uh, um, we couldn't service them because mm -hmm. of the price point. Sure, sure. Well, I think you know you've got the right formula here. Ninety nine dollars. Um, you know, a development platform that gets people doing parallel computing and make it accessible that that's just terrific news so uh, uh thanks again for sharing that with us today oh, thanks rich i appreciate uh giving me the chance you bet you bet okay folks that's it for the rich report stay tuned for more news and information on high performance computing